Hi, welcome to my talk. This is Negotiating Objectivity, Moving Beyond Fan Ethnography and the Comforts of Familiarity in a Study of Harsh Noise Communities. So with this talk, I'm going to be looking at what I think are some serious issues that arise ethically through the practice of objectivity and discussing the method that I have used to overcome these so far and the issues that arise when this method is no longer acceptable and how I hope to develop a new tool. So, the structure of this talk will be as such. We'll begin with my place within and in relation to networks, a discussion of issues relating to objectivity, Objectivity is a non-human actor and actor network theory. Judith Buller and performativity. Objectivity is a performative act. And feeling a gender, feeling objectivity. And these sound quite opaque just now, but we'll clarify them as they go along. So, first of all, in regards to networks and my position within them, I will be discussing my position within academia and in relation to a community that I hope to carry out an ethnographic study of, namely the harsh noise community. Now, working within academia and with an ethnographic model presents ethical problems, and I'll be discussing one of these issues, namely the objectivity-subjectivity split, and how I hope to overcome it. So the first question is, how does ethnography enact hierarchies and how does objectivity fit into this? So objectivity and rigour are considered key to ethnography, but this often means the inequalities in purpose in researcher and subject are often minimised. This can be seen with Boy's classic study of the English folk revival, or Benilla Silva talking about how race is embodied within ethnography and the idea of the academics, particularly white academics studying black communities, have a sense of superiority, a sense they know things, and this I, you know, am um, positioning ourselves as objective academics who know things, means that we begin to look at those we study as those who do not know things. We begin to enact a power relationship. So why am I arguing that objectivity is itself a problem? So I'm going to look at objectivity for a moment through the lens of Derrida's deconstructionism. So in the first stage of deconstructionism, Derrida argues that diametric oppositions are a mask for a power relationship. That is when we are offered choices which have two opposing poles. And now within this power relationship, the second part of the opposition only exists to strengthen the first. So an example would be male-female, heterosexual, homosexual, objectivity, subjectivity. So within this way of looking oppositions, female only exists in relation to male in the only exist to strengthen and give validity to the male. Likewise, homosexuality exists to validate and give strength and structure and existence to heterosexuality. And subjectivity only exists in that it gives strength, meaning and existence to objectivity. And we can know Ignore the power relationships and the hierarchies that are inherent within this. And exposing and opposing these hierarchies is an important component in my own theoretical work. So, how have I been going about this up until now? 
and why can't I continue in this vein? So I've been using fan ethnography, which is a model from Jeanette Monaco's paper, Memory Work, Autoethnography and the Construction of a Fan Ethnography. And fan ethnography asks us if we are a member of the group that we are studying, you know, if we are fans of a TV show or a form of music, or if we are part of the network we are studying, and to acknowledge that and understand that we cannot be truly objective because our subjectivity is important in the work that we are doing. And she argues that this can be used as a tool to make explicit rather than implicit the ways in which locations of identity and emotional registers inform research choices and processes and for foregrounding the theoretical implications of objective subjective dualisms. So this is us returning once more to this idea I was discussing in relation to deconstructionism, the power relationships that exist within these dualisms within these splits and how it informs our research methods and our identities as academics. And the issue I'm facing just now is that this is the first work I'm going to undertake or I am not a member of or fan of the group that I am studying, namely the harsh noise community. So this means that I have to develop a new tool for problematising objectivity without a fan ethnography. So I'm going to argue that conceptualisation of objectivity as an actor within actor network theory would provide the first step towards a critical tool to use against the objective-subjective split. And the combining this with an argument that objectivity can be seen as a performative act that produces us, the fantasised rational academics, would help develop this tool further. And that by combining these, we could develop a theoretical model for decentering and problematizing objectivity. Now both actor network theory and Judith Butler's theories of performativity are very complex, so we'll unpack them a little bit and see how they would work within this framework. So first of all, let's look at actor network theory, in particular the idea of non-human actors and how we can define objectivity as an actor. So actor network theory is a methodological approach that seeks to trace the influences and interactions within the network. And Pike has said that the task for scholars is to trace this ramshackle set of promiscuous associations that spill out across conventional parsings of the world. So what they're arguing here is that if we engage with actor network theory, our task becomes the tracing of the influence of actors. And actors are complex entities, we'll discuss that in a moment. They defer agency, the ability to speak, to be seen, to be present within the network. And actor network theory allows for the existence of actors that are non-human, such as printed materials. So Pike had discusses literary journals and magazines or technological devices. So she and in her work discusses wearable technology as an actor. Now, my contention is the concepts can themselves be seen as actors. So the ideas contained within the printed materials by Cut discusses and the concept of technology that's discussed explicitly by Schiermeister cannot be separated from the mediums. If we are talking about a literary journal, then we cannot separate the journal itself from the ideas contained within it. And if we're talking about wearable tech, we can separate that from the concept of technology and how this acts 
within a network. So this idea of agency, Pika asks, how does this action, that is the granting of agency, take place? Through a train of translations that disperse and circulate agency. Agency is not circulated in a single entity. It is leaky. So if we were going to continue down this path of discussing objectivity and the construction of an academic self through actor network theory, we could perhaps look at what it means for the what the permeability of agency and the status of actors means. We could even ask if the hierarchies within academia hold this in place and stop agency being leaky and only granted to some people. But the main area that I want to focus on right now is performativity and Judith Butler's theories about how we construct gendered and sexed bodies. So we'll be discussing performing academia. So the construction of a duality that allows academics to situate themselves against the other, the subject of investigation, who are self-absent, that is, they don't have knowledge of self, and are subject to our objectivity, is simply that, a construct. It's something we have made. And Butler's theories of performativity and the use of foreclosures in the creation of a stable understanding of a gendered self can help us understand this. And the argument that Bu the Butler would make as to the boundaries of self, the body must be maintained for the purposes of societal regulation and control. And if we are going to argue that objectivity is a performative act, then we can ask if this performativity in the formation of an academic self is maintained for the purposes of, of social regulation and control. So let's actually look at what Judith Butler says and then try and take her part and come to an understanding of it. She argues that such acts, gestures, enactments generally constructed are performative in the sense that the essence or identity that they otherwise purport to express are fabrications manufactured and sustained through corporal signs and other discursive means. That the gendered body is performative suggests there is no ontological status apart from the various acts which constitute its reality. So this is a considerable mouthful. It contains some really big ideas, so let's begin the process of unpacking it. What Butler is arguing is the Gendered and sexed bodies have no reality beyond the performance of sex and gender. That by doing gender, we create gender. And that's not much of a picking apart, but let's go a little bit deeper. So the gendered body is only possible through the construction of another and through the enactment of a set of gestures and norms which themselves create the identity being enacted. So the identity of the gendered self is constructed through the performance of gender. Likewise, the creation of a community of academics who study non-academics and the enactment of this through a set of gestures and norms which themselves create the dichotomy being enacted is only possible through the enactment of this dichotomy. The formation of an academic and non-academic duality is essentially no different from how gender and sex is constructed. We can look at them as being analogous to each other. And I would argue 
the objectivity is one of these performative acts. And that by enacting objectivity, then the subjectivity of the non-academic can be itself enacted and the power relationship of the dichotomy can be formed. So by enacting objectivity, we create the subjectivity of the other, the non-academic, and the power relationship of the dichotomy comes into being. So, this seems a bit hopeless, but Butler argues that it is possible to fail a gender, to unperform gender. So, Butler offers the possibility of deconstruction and transformation through a failure to repeat a deformality, a parodic repetition that exposes the constructed nature of gender. That is by performing gender wrong, by deliberately failing or parodying gender, then we can expose its nature as a constructed thing and not something that's natural. So why, what might this look like for the performance of academic objectivity? So let's look at failing objectivity, at unperforming academia. So accepting the objectivity as a way of performing academia opens up the opportunity for that very same failure to repeat deformality or parodic repetition to be created. We can queer, for want of a better term, objectivity in academia. And through doing so, we can expose this nature as something that's constructed. So what kind of form might this take? Well, this might take the form of accepting that there's no firm line demarcating self and other. This is something that very much is a part of the methodology that I've been using up until now, that you can't separate yourself as observer from who you're observing, that we are all part of the same group, the same network. This may also be achieved through the use of a model of critical autoethnography, which foregrounds our experience of an embodiment which is grounded in an understanding of our own interactions with an embodiment of systems of oppression. And this is yet another one of those big idea-packed sentences. So first of all, what is Autoethnography. Well, autoethnography is the ethnographic study of the self. And critical autoethnography is to understand the ethnographic study of the self through a lens of critical theory. And if we allow the critical theory as a way of understanding systems of oppression, then we can use critical autoethnography to see how the self is embodied within and embodies systems of oppression. Because in the end, it is not the objectivity that we share with others, but it's the subjectivity that is the wealth that we have in common. And through realising this, and through acknowledging and foregrounding our subjectivity, and by acknowledging this as part of our theoretical work and our methodologies, then you know, by failing at academia, by failing objectivity, then we can become better academics. Thank you and that was my talk. Thank you very much.